Okay, our final reader this evening is Mr. Ray Zemer. R.G. Zemer is a writer of fiction and poetry. He runs a construction company and teaches composition at the College of DuPage. He makes his home in Warrenville on the west branch of the DuPage River. Recent poetry has appeared in the journals Revealits and Prairie Light Review. Ray is currently seeking representation for his young adult novel, The Ghost of Jamie McVeigh. So if any of you are agents out there, he's the man. He participates in the Naperville Writing Group. He's a big part of our community here at Waterline Writers in many areas. And he also participates in other area open mic venues. Ray, please. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll read some poetry today. And uh, I, I assume that there's probably some uh, cat lovers in the group, so this is for them. A green eyed cat. A green eyed cat came by the house, white with gray patches. He drifted like a ghost lurking just where we weren't really looking. He curled on a cushion outside on the porch, grew comfortable. He complained he was hungry, mewling for food, and we fed him with our own house cat's kibble. He was clearly not starving, was well-groomed and neat. His flea collar told us that surely a home must have someplace been waiting a family wondering, where is that cat? Like the wraith that he was, he appeared and then faded. A Cheshire cat vanished for days. Until some random morning wove all through my legs as I walked up the drive. We debated our choices. Could we bring him inside or cage him for transport to have him ID'd? We dithered and argued while he licked his gray paws. But then came a day that the neighbor reported he'd found the white cat in the shrubbery, not torn by coyotes as often we'd feared, but mysteriously dead all the same, still and white with gray paws, dead of our indecision, Dead is the next plan considered and failed. One more kindness never undertaken. Another regret to claw at our hearts, but we cannot unkill him, the green-eyed cat. Uh, this, uh, it strikes me that a lot of the uh, poems here are, uh, have to do with loss, uh, dealing with loss. Uh, Sometimes we do that with wine, and uh, sometimes uh, the uh, descriptions of the wine can be somewhat entertaining. So this is uh, imagining a, a wine called Desire. Savor this alluring, enigmatic wine whose mystery entices you into its thrall. Its intensity of cranberry blood redolent with a profusion of aromas late hour coffee, indulgent chocolate, wild raspberry of untamed lands, high in spirits so willful, wanton, fierce, generous in the mouth, yet craving more, hungrier for kisses, moist and lascivious. The palate overwhelmed with such intensity of flavor, prolonging pleasure with its lingering aftertaste a smooth and honeyed pungency of languorous and sated appetite, well served with any meat you crave. And then there may be a grief, uh, a wine called grief. This is a heavy wine and thick with the dull ache of emptiness. The color of a teardrop, though it's often clouded, blurred for holding back the light, it can be difficult to swallow, viscid as a strangling sob, an ancient cobweb at the back of your throat. Its pang assails the palate, burns the tongue, transmutes to vinegar in your mouth. Inhale the sense of deep resentment, of damp earth rank over a small grave. 
Pair this wine with bitter herbs and salt. The caustic taint of stifled rage may linger for a long, long time. Uh, it's not all uh, bad memories from, from loss, though. Uh, this is a poem I'd like to uh, read for a friend I lost last year called Steve Kirchen. He was a uh, kayaker, a woodworker, uh, a uh, environmentalist, and a good friend, and actually a poet he read here at Waterline once. For Steve Kirchen. They think you cannot lose your way just floating downstream with the current. But we know how channels split and weave and slow sometimes to steaming backwaters thick with duckweed. So mired in sluggish oxbows of indecision, I remember all the times you paddled through. From blue spring deeps, your memory will lift me out and carry me for one more mile, replenish me for one more hopeful after. As a paddle slips below, sculling smoothly with the flow, liquid as a dream, your voice will whisper riffles in the river when I hesitate to draw. Your kindly spirit will come to me with cries of conscience chirping on the verges of my soul. And I count on you to always keep me honest with the earth. Um, this uh, next poem I wrote for a uh, event over in Aurora for, uh, it was a suicide awareness event at the uh, library there. And uh, when first call for poets came out, I thought, well, I don't really have anybody in my life who would. And then I thought, well, maybe, maybe I did. And that's the problem is sometimes you just, you just don't know. And sometimes that's, that's, uh, that doubt is, is hard to deal with. So this is called doubt. Uh, it's for a friend of mine. It gnaws at me, those times I don't expect it, and your image floats up on a flood of memory, enveloped in the thing we'll never know, the mystery of motive or mistake. Could you really have deliberately drifted off to sleep, left the engine running hot, slipped so easily from life? Why would you leave us brokenhearted, helpless, guilty, and unsure? Oh yes, and when we sang the blues, could I not have heard an echo from a black and empty room? Could I not have seen the red eyes glowing from the darkness of that pit? I'd like to say it was an accident, a drunken stupor turned to tragedy. Let me clear the tainted air, turn out the light, and slam the door to that garage. Let me go back to my business. But still that nasty little rodent of snuffling doubt I know is lurking in a corner under something. Uh, this poem is, uh, again, very personal stuff, but uh, this one sometimes uh, or those we've lost come back to us and it's not so bad. This is, Dad appeared in my dream. Dad appeared in my dream dressed in work clothes, a smudged white t-shirt and pants worn at the knees, hair gray and disheveled. He looked a bit haggard and weary from work. Same age as ever, whatever that means. I'm sure he was younger than the age I am now. That's a hell of a thing to be older than Dad. Although he's been gone for some 21 years, it, it wasn't surprising to see him. Every once in a while, he'll just show up like that. And he's always quite welcome to stay. It seemed in the dream I had opened a door, and there he was standing with both my grown sons. 
They blinked, mildly startled, like I'd caught, <laughs> caught them at something. But clearly, they only were off to a job. Dad hefted a pipe wrench, and over his shoulder, some bright copper tubing was slung in a loop. The boys also toted their tools in a bucket and paced all impatient to be on their way. I said not a word, didn't ask what their mission, just glad to see Dad on the job once again, ready as always to fix some old thing. Glad to see Dad looking eager and willing to bail the boys out of some trouble or other. Whatever it was, it would turn out all right. I did wonder why he hadn't called out to me, but he must have been satisfied I was okay. So this last one is, uh, this last is, uh, goes back to the south side of Chicago. Anybody who grew up around Marquette Park neighborhood knew what you meant by the, the, the monument in Marquette Park. It's a big uh, Art Deco triangle of, of, uh, of marble uh, dedicated to the memory of two Lithuanian-American flyers who'd done a transatlantic flight and crashed. But, you know, when you're a kid, you don't care about any of that stuff. This is, you know, you see this thing, you've just got to climb it. That's it's all it's about. So. so this is apologies to Darius and Gerenus. I'm sorry I never really understood your monument in Market Park. Though I tried, like every other kid, to climb its marble slickness, scampering up the steep incline until momentum spent, I teetered tree high, dizzy boy gawking at the concrete cracked and beckoning below, and hard a flutter clutched the sides of the airplane's wing to slide down on my knees. Darius, I never knew you shed your blood for America when you fought the first great war in France. And I didn't know you went back home to Lithuania to take up arms again, this time to save your homeland's Baltic port. And Stas Virenas, well, I never could appreciate your skills, your expertise with aircraft in those early days of flying. Your work with wrench and rivet gun to modify your single engine plane your little Lituanica would soar 4,000 miles across the broad Atlantic, carry men and dreams with pride above the stormy northern sea. I must have read the bright inscription of your sacrifice and valor, gazed upon the globe of burnished bronze, but I never felt the darkness and the danger in the night when you fell into the forest with a crash and I never knew the empty air of stillness that ensued. But I am happy to report I finally scaled your plain wing monument, stood high atop the gleaming marble, exulting through the leaf tops of the dying south side elms, above the lapping waters of the Market Park Lagoon, streets and bungalows and gangways spread below, a boy heroic poised in victory. Thank you.